1. I'm 27, child-free, and have never been a maternal person. Early on last year, I was diagnosed with a chronic progressive nerve disease called Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, CRPS. I had an injury at work two and a half years ago, and have had CRPS now for about 18 months. The injury was to my dominant hand, right hand, and my CRPS is from fingertips to the side of my neck on my right side and stomach. It has no cure, and minimal treatments. I'm always 7 to 10 out of 10 pain, 24-7. My normal daily life is hard, and I rely on having my partner's help to do the smallest things. I can't put on or take off shirts, bra, and some pants by myself. I can't cut up my own food, right, wash, dry, put my hair up by myself, prepare dinner, submerge my hand in water, do washing up or vacuuming because of vibrations, etc. If we have to travel out of town, it takes me two days to recover, and I'm bedbound with a spew bucket for the whole two days. The vibrations from the car causes me so much pain that I always have to have spew bags with me. I recently had a conversation with my mum about wanting to get my tubes tied. This is when she lost it at me. I was explaining to her how I can barely care for myself without my partner, let alone a child. Plus, pregnancy really ramps up CRPS and can cause me more issues, pain, spreading of my condition. Plus, birthing, either naturally or C-section, can make it spread to my private organs. I was telling her that it would be selfish to have a child because I wouldn't be able to give the kid a proper life and would be unfair to my partner too as he would have to take on so much more responsibility. She told me I was selfish and I'd live a sad and lonely life when I was older, etc. That no reputable doctor would touch me if I asked them to tie my tubes. I asked her, well, what methods of contraception would you suggest then? I can't go on the pill or the rod because of my migraines. Contraceptives fuck with CRPS and condoms aren't failsafe. She replied, You know my stance, I think it's a stupid decision and that you're selfish for even considering this. I have thought about all of this in the current medical situation I'm in, let alone how different and more difficult things will be if my CRPS spreads further, which pregnancy can make it do. Especially if it's a C-section, which then poses more complications of it spreading to the site and then causing lifelong complications with my reproductive organs, fertility, sexual ability, etc. I don't know what to do. Mum keeps saying that you need to give me a granddaughter, you're the only one left who can still have kids. I would love to have a biological grandchild, it's now up to you. She has 11 step grandsons, no biological grandchildren, as I'm her only child. She is refusing to understand my concerns and just continues to berate me and call me selfish, for not wanting to bring a child into the world that I physically can't care for. CRPS is an insanely cruel disease. Many, many people have had it for over 30 years and have it full body. I have extreme hypersensitivity, allodynia, in my affected limb. I can't stand having material or anything touch my arm, hand, or wear a sling most days. If something does touch my hand or brush my hand, I will be in tears and throwing up because of the pain. I can't even hold an empty coffee cup in my hand, let alone a child. One of the things that frustrates me the most is the fact that she's seen me in a full-blown flare-up, crying, shaking, and throwing up because of pain. Fingers locking up, having to physically pry my fingers open after a massive pain spike that then caused severe cramping in my hand, having to use a walking stick or have my partner half carry me to bed while I'm bawling my eyes out because I can't walk because of how much pain I'm in. She's seen all of this, and still has the audacity to call me the selfish one. She lives two and a half hours away, and has stayed with me for a total of two nights in the seven years I've lived in this town. I'm always the one who has to travel to see her. Plus now with this condition, traveling is becoming harder and harder to be able to tolerate. I'm just so frustrated and upset. Also, for anyone who's curious about CRPS, Please look up the CRPS pain scale to better understand the level of pain we go through. I love my mum, but I'm close to going no contact. And for those who may be about to ask why my partner doesn't get a vasectomy, we aren't married, we have talked about it, but I don't want him to make that choice for my sake. 
I know that it's definite that I'm not having kids. I don't want him to get the snip and then we break up many years later and he then decides he wants kids with a new partner and have that risk of it not being able to be reversed as they aren't 100% reversible. It wouldn't be fair on him. He's already put aside so much and changed his life around so much to help care for me. I'd personally see him getting the snip as another burden on him, which I don't want him to physically alter his body for my sake. 2. I'm an English teacher. Love the job. I mostly love my students and their parents. I feel blessed that most parents are good people. They are worried about their children and progress, can be angry but can always be reasoned with. I get positive feedback on my teaching and managing my classes, and the students' parents are generally happy with me. Unfortunately, I still have to deal with entitled parents from time to time. The Karens of parenthood. This year I have four classes of last year's students. They will take their exams, and with a bit of luck, I can shake their hands at graduation and wish them the best in their future education and life when they get their diploma. To get to that point, they still need to take their exams for their subjects, mine included. They can work in digital books or in their regular paper-bound ones. I don't really care what works best for them. I also don't mind tutoring them, but I have my conditions. You do your homework, you pay attention. If and when you think you understand, you can start on the homework. You do not interrupt me when I'm talking or explaining. You ask questions. Basically the basics of what a student should do. This class knows exactly what the days and times are for their test, including the material. I made those dates known two months in advance, as I know that some really need and could use the time. I have uploaded everything in Google Classroom concerning the materials of the last three tests, along with links and materials for extra practice. Enter Entitled Student. Entitled Student doesn't work in my subject in class. I have corrected him numerous times, sent numerous emails to his parents and team lead about his behavior, and have had many meetings with all parties involved. Promises are made by him and his parents about bettering himself. He knows and understands that what he does isn't good for him and doesn't help create a healthy learning environment. For added info, he doesn't have any learning difficulties, mental health issues, or anything. This behavior was known in primary school and the years before. School isn't a priority. His own words. I've offered tutoring on the previously named conditions and told him that with his current behavior, he can't get my tutoring. He's free to ask other teachers, but at the risk, they will ask me about him, refer him back to me, and or refuse him. Both him and his parents understand that and have said so. They agreed with what was said. To the story. Exams are coming up. He has not done a thing. Every piece of advice has been given, and a lot has been practiced. They are drilled and drilled on the strategies, tricks, and everything they might encounter. Then, the week before the holidays, there are no excuses. Students can make appointments with teachers, or teachers can invite students for extra help, etc. I have sent two different emails to two different groups per class. Both students and parents got this email. One saying that the student is more than welcome to come at XYZ time, if needed, but I need to know if a student comes and what they want to know so I can provide material. I sent a couple of links with extra material to practice for good measure. I sent another email to another group or class. I basically told the parents and students that although I am disappointed that they didn't do the work in and for class for the exams, I am willing to tutor them at YYS time in this week. Same amount of time as the students who did put in the effort, along with material and links. Why did I do this? Quite simple. I want my students to pass. Some were lazy because they had good grades and understanding of the material. However, some don't and are just lazy. I didn't want them to fail and then retake the year. Also, it puts me in the parents and schools good books, you know, in case things go to hack. The same information is also posted in their Google Classroom space. I get several responses thanking me for my time and effort, especially for those who didn't do a thing in class. Three students took me up on the offer, they came, we discussed some things, and they practiced some more. 
So the week for tutoring ends. Time slots are over, and then it happens. I got an email from Entitled Parent, the mother to the Entitled Student, last Friday evening. She wanted to know if there was another possibility for her son to have some tutoring. Since I needed to reply to a different email, I also responded to the EP and told her no. The holiday starts on Monday, this Monday. Lasts for two weeks. Mondays are my day off. Tuesday, I am not at school due to private matters. Husband has surgery, I'm taking him. And Wednesday is the test for my subject. He's had the entire week to come to the different times stipulated in the Google Classroom. And the email. For good measure, I asked if a colleague wanted to help in our teacher group chat. Three said they wouldn't mind. I suggest to EM to email those colleagues of mine and see if one of them has time on Monday or Tuesday before the exam on Wednesday. On Saturday, the EP sent an email to me demanding that I tutor her son, the entitled student. Her reasoning? He needs it, so I should just do it. He's my student, and it's my job, no one else's. I've got holidays now, so I should have plenty of time to help her son out. I don't respond. It's my holiday, and after two near burnouts, I've learned my lesson about not working in the holidays. It's Wednesday now, and this woman has sent no less than 22 emails. I just had contact with a colleague, who is like the team lead of my department of students. He is pissed, and will deal with it. I'm so glad that this parent doesn't have my number. 3. So last night was fun. I am disabled due to a hit-and-run driver. I don't get disability, so on my good days, when my bag isn't hurting too much, I do delivery for a popular online retailer that also owns a chain of grocery stores. Last night I start my delivery shift. Of course, Karen's being Karen's, the first order, which is upstairs, also includes cases of water and gallons of water. Because, of course it does. Since this apartment complex decides that 24-point type is an appropriate script to write their unit numbers on, instead of anything that, say, a paramedic or delivery person could see from a distance, I'm out of my car, on foot, looking for the apartment. Since Karen did not answer either my text message or phone calls asking for help locating her delivery location. While I'm on foot, heading back to my car, because I think I've spotted the correct building number, a large and aggressive dog comes at me. I run and get in my car, but not without falling, twisting my ankle and biting down so hard that I chipped a tooth. Which sucks. I get in the car, the dog is now gone. Don't know where he went. Did the owner of the dog catch it? I don't know. I was in the car in pain, catching my breath. So I call our on-the-road support folks, who generally are pretty helpful and get permission to return this delivery to the store. And then Karen calls me back. I do not know why I answered. My can-do customer service instincts. But I told support, hold on, it looks like the customer is actually calling me back. Let me see if I can get this order delivered. Oh man. So I answer. Karen starts demanding why I haven't delivered the order yet. I told her, hey, I just got injured by one of your neighbor's dogs. My ankle is hurt. Can you give me a little help here finding your place? I just want to get your groceries. And Karen goes on a rant about how the groceries aren't for her. They are for her daughter, who is a nursing student with a large protective dog. And her daughter normally uses a folding wagon for groceries. And maybe she'll come down and help grab those groceries. Nope. Karen's daughter does not want to do that, but she'll make sure to keep her large protective dog inside. I'm left wondering if this is the same dog that tried to eat my liver. I told Karen that's okay. While I am expected to deliver the groceries to the door, dispatch has given me permission to return the order to the store. I can complete the order. The pain in my ankle hasn't set in that much, adrenaline and all, and Karen insists on me staying on the phone with her the whole time. And the whole time she's going on and on about how she wanted the delivery completed by a certain time, and I was not going to be delivered on time. I told her I understand that. I did not expect to have a dog come after me either, nor to get hurt. But I am completing the delivery in spite of being injured. Why, 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 why was I so stupid? I couldn't put much weight on my ankles, so I couldn't carry as much as usual, and it took me a long time. 
so it took me about four or five trips to get this lady's stuff all in front of her daughter's door. The nursing student daughter, who never so much as poked her head out to see if I was okay. Karen was angry at me the whole time, talking about how I raised her blood pressure so much her chest was hurting. Huh? How's that? By delivering her grocery order and taking longer than usual to do so? I don't know if she called the company to complain, but it was the next to worst delivery I've ever been on. The worst being in 2018, where some yahoo out in the middle of nowhere decided to shoot at me for bringing them something that they ordered. Thankfully, that guy was a bad shot, and no, they did not get their delivery and were banned forever. But the police did nothing to the dude. So it's the next day, I slept for like uh, 10 or 11 hours, and I'm posting this. My ankle seems to have a mild sprain, my other foot hurts, and my tooth is still chipped. I'm waiting back to see if I'll get paid for the amount of time I had to work over thanks to this nonsense. Independent contractor work. Yay. P.S. I don't know about most of y'all, but if someone was injured bringing me food, I would want to see that they were all right. I most certainly would be kind and sympathetic if it took a few extra minutes for them to bring me the food. I could have just not answered Karen's call, taken the groceries back to the store when I was done with my other deliveries, and still would have been paid. At worst, I would have missed out on a tip if Karen actually tipped at all, but I also would have been paid for the extra time it took to take those groceries back to the store, so completing that order most definitely went against my best interests, and I'm left wondering if the dog that came after me was Karen's daughter's dog. People in this area can be so irresponsible about dogs, and I love doggos, they're my favorite critters. 4. Now I love my family a lot, but a lot of stuff has been going on and I need to give some context. So about half a year ago, my grandfather sold his house. Even though the house was completely destroyed, he still got a lot for the land. Two lots and around the corner from the beach at peak house prices, he made double what he expected. Now my grandfather, my legal guardian, like me, loves his family a lot. And my uncle was going through some financial trouble, so he moved them down here in the same small town. Now my uncle wasn't a great parent, and he was a drug addict. I'm talking like meth and fentanyl. His girlfriend, apparently sober, but that just made it worse that they have an eight or nine year old daughter that lives with them full time and a busy 17 year old daughter that visits every once in a while. She told me about finding tin foil in random places in the house and anyone in the drug scene knows that means fentanyl. The girlfriend does nothing but enable his drug use despite having a small child in the house. Well, things all went to shit when my grandfather died. My grandfather was like the glue that held our family together, and he was a great man, even though he also enabled my uncle to do a lot of stupid things. The first big thing that happened was my uncle crashed his car that was being paid for by my grandfather. It was very confusing when I was grilled by the cops on the phone, because apparently my dead grandfather got into a car crash and fled the scene. I told them that he was dead, and they were like, then who crushed the car? I immediately knew it was my uncle and gave them the info they needed. I later found out that my uncle gave five or six different stories on what happened, on top of him fleeing the scene, and when the cops showed up to his house, he was knocked out cold and somehow he didn't get charged. Now we all knew based on what he'd told that he nodded off while driving because he was high. The story he stuck with didn't make sense, he said he swerved to avoid a deer, but it was right next to a high tunnel where no deer lived, and he swerved across four lanes of traffic and flipped his car into a ditch. But after that, he pretty much pretended it never happened. Now, without my grandfather paying for all his stuff, he's on the verge of being homeless. Both he and his girlfriend didn't work and receive government money. But it's not enough to afford the rent, and even then they blow it on dumb shit because they're lazy. He decided that he was going to call the place in charge of his bills and say he can't pay it. Now me and my parents are responsible for paying six months of his unpaid bills because we are still living at the place my grandfather was renting and he was paying all the rent and bills. 
So not only that, but my mom and other uncle now have access to my grandfather's banking history. Apparently, he was giving my uncle thousands and thousands of dollars. At least 10k for sure. They owe the girlfriend's mom $12,000, and he cut them off financially about seven years ago. My uncle thinks if he just owns up to what he does and gives some sort of reason, people will just forgive him. The worst part is my grandfather had a lot of money in the bank that is going to be split evenly between my dad and his brothers. My crazy drug addict uncle is about to receive between 100 and 150,000 in the next few months, and I honestly don't know if he will even last long enough to see it. I love my family, and hope that my uncle's girlfriend grows a pair and leaves him, taking the child with her because he is a dangerous mess. I'm just hoping he never comes around my part of town because nobody here wants to talk to him. Also, he tried to invite his fentanyl dealer to my grandfather's funeral, even though my grandfather hated him. We all know of him, because the first thing that comes up when you Google the dude is the news article about him getting caught trafficking $200,000 worth of drugs. Even better is when anyone confronts him on the drug abuse, he just blames my dad, who used to be a drug addict but has recovered two years clean, and I'm so proud of him for anything involving drugs. It sucks not really being able to do anything, especially knowing that there is a little girl in danger. I just hope he's able to change before things get any worse. My parents say that isn't going to happen till he's face first into some pavement with nothing and nobody. And sadly, I'm going to have to agree. I don't know what makes my uncle think that he's entitled to put no effort into anything and leech thousands of dollars off of people that care about him. 5. I decided to go to the mall today because I haven't been there in a while and needed some stuff. Due to the nature of my career, my back hurts only just all the damn time. I came upon a section of those leg and back massaging chairs and said, hell yeah. Some things to know about these chairs. These go through a series of four to five different types of massages, whilst it also squeezes and massages your legs. One of the types of massages it does in your back, it just goes up and down your spine with hard and fast chopping-like motions. There's also other sections of these grouped-together chairs placed all throughout the mall. So there were others that could be used, and in the area where I was, there were five other chairs grouped around me. I was in the upper left corner of that group of chairs. There was not a single person using any of the other five chairs. I wasn't really paying attention to where I was located, but right in front of me was a baby clothes store. Some things to know about me. I'm on the spectrum. I'm also not a fan of kids or babies. Most importantly, I'm getting my half-hour massage. I don't want to have to interact with other people. I just want to be left the hell alone. Here comes our entitled mother. And the entitled kid. He looks about nine or ten-ish. I don't know, not great at guessing kids' ages. He's also pretty chunky, which is a detail you'll need for later. The EM also had a baby in a stroller, but it didn't really do anything relevant to this incident. So, they end up standing right in front of me, and the EM told the kid that she wanted to look in this baby clothes store, but the EK didn't want to. So she tells him to go get a massage on one of the chairs while he waits for her. And of course... They head straight to the chair next to me. Why? Why? There's five whole other available chairs. <sighs> it's literally printed how much money gets you however many minutes you get in the chair. She asks me the price, so I point to where it clearly tells you the price is. Then she asks where to put the money in. So yet again, I point out exactly where it goes. It's even lit up. Brightly. But just before she's about to put the money in, the conversation between them happens. What if I don't like it? You will. It's really relaxing. But what if it hurts? It won't. See, this lady's been sitting here for a while and she's enjoying it. But what if I don't enjoy it? Can you go first and see if you like it? No, Mommy's going to go right to look at the baby clothes. But maybe if you ask nicely, this lady will let you try her. Nope, not getting up. 
It's only a dollar for five minutes. If he doesn't like it, he can get off. The EM gave me a pissy look and just said, Fine, EK, just sit there and try it, and come join me in the store if you don't like it. So the EK, yes, I'm still salty at this point, that they put his ass in the seat next to me, and not any of the other five completely open and available chairs. Starts off not doing anything except sitting there, thank God, but then an instant later all hell breaks loose, when the chair simultaneously grabs his legs, good and tight, and the chopping starts getting going. The kid starts just making this really loud crying and whining that starts off somewhat quietly, but gets insanely loud when he realizes his legs are too big to get out of the grip of the chair. I said, dude, just calm down, the leg grip will let go in a minute, and then you can get out. But his cry yelling, builds to a shrieking, Mom! That kid has massive lungs. That yell was so incredibly loud and went on for so long until his mom comes flying out of the store and just parks her baby stroller right in front of me. Where it starts crying and the mom starts yelling over the kid in the chair, asking him what's wrong. And the EK says, The chair is fucking my back and it's got my legs and I'm trapped! EM starts trying to pick EK up. But the leg part lets go, so they both kind of stumbled back into the stroller, which makes the baby start crying even louder. Then EM says to me, Why didn't you pull him out when it started hurting him because it was set too high? Let me interject here. The settings are pre-adjusted, you can't change them. But most importantly, how is this my goddamn fault to begin with? Then she says, Or you could have come into the store to get me. Again, how is this my fault or responsibility? The EK was fake sniffing because he wasn't even crying to begin with, just doing an insanely loud whining and screech. So, she told him they'll go to the food court to get ice cream. Not the most exciting story on here, but incredibly annoying to deal with when I just wanted to be left the fuck alone on my one day off and enjoy my damn chair massage. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here. And thank you very much for listening to The Impractical Pronouns of Parents, I Pop, episode 107. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, I would appreciate it if you booped the like button. It's fun, you should try it. It's not fun, but I still appreciate it. Anyway, let's see. Uh, no other business today, I don't think. Uh, I don't think, I don't think, uh, but nope. So let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... And it comes thanks very much to Kathy Beckford, so thank you very much, Kathy, for supplying the question. If you could be a Muppet, which one would you be? And I think the obvious answer there is Animal. He has the most fun, has no cares, and, uh, well, quite frankly, all the other Muppets suck in comparison to Animal. But you may have different answers which are possibly valid in some odd sideways universe, so please do let me know what you think in a comment below. 